Pets are an important part of culture. Oxford defines pet as a domestic or tamed animal kept for companionship or pleasure. I'll tweak that a bit to say a domestic or tamed organism kept by another organism with higher intelligence for companionship or pleasure. Mostly companionship though, I don't know what they mean by pleasure and I'm too afraid to ask. In this video, I'll talk about various pets in a planet called Origin, which has multiple different species of people with different pet preferences. I'll talk a bit about why a wild animal was ideal for domestication, and what's changed in the domestication process. I'll talk about a bunch of different organisms, mostly animals, but hopefully this video won't be too long. I'll start with five species I've actually talked about in previous videos. The lovebird is a tiny drake that's native to the jungles in the Orient, but since its discovery can be found in homes all over the world. Its small size, hardiness, and fast reproduction makes it an incredible pet and it has a relatively long lifespan of 10 to 12 years. They were domesticated quite recently, but can be found in all sorts of new colors and patterns since then. Other than that, not much else has changed. They'll eat just about everything, but their beaks can easily cut off a fingertip when they're anxious, so it's best to take good care of them and keep them happy. They love climbing, and they're happiest when they're free to roam around wherever they want. People who keep them usually dedicate a room to their pair of lovebirds. The Bumblecot is another dragon that has recently been kept as a pet, though this time it's insectoid. Because their domestication is so recent, there's also not that much that's changed since it started. It's an efficient hunter with exceptional intelligence that makes for great pest control and companionship. Its fluffy fur is a nice bonus, which sheds as it's brushed and can be used for various fabrics. The Bumblecot is especially popular with humans, as it likes to mimic their voices with something like a meow. This unnerves most other people, since the bumblecot also tends to mimic the sounds of its prey, but humans seem to think it's cute. The bumblecot is great at following orders, and people are working on making breeds focus on work in law enforcement and security. For now, they're much too small for that stuff and tend to behave more like cats. The false bull is less of a pet and more of a work animal, but sometimes it can be a companion. It's not easy to tell if they're domesticated without the colorful gadgets but sometimes they've got color morphs that wouldn't be seen in the wild. These animals are kept in noir and not anywhere else. They seem to respect the dead flame in a special way, and they don't seem to like Nucius. The story is that Nucius kind of look like bulls, but no one's entirely sure why the false bull reacts so negatively to them. Usually it's no trouble unless the Nucius gets too close or tries to touch the bull, but if they do it, they might give them anything from a dirty look to a charging stance. False bulls were used to traverse the Noir Desert and get heavy loads of goods around, but since climate change has made the area much less harsh, they are not as useful. A few people have them for companionship, or even to help around with lifting things, but this seems to be a dying practice. The mouse plant is a domesticated plant that's kept very similarly to a hamster. These smart plants suck up insects with their trunks and have fast metabolisms. They communicate with other mouse plants by squeaking, but that's not very well understood. Their domestication has made them more plump and brightly colored. Their leaves are smaller and photosynthesis is less efficient because they depend more on because they depend more on heterotrophy and often don't get much sunlight. The wild ones are found in the Orient, and while the pets are more popular there, it's not uncommon to see them around origin. Mouse plants can see ultraviolet light, and some people tried to train them to be useful with that, but it didn't work out and it's much cheaper to just use a flashlight anyway. The Tanacat is a strange being found in small populations across the world. They were recently discovered to be life as we don't know it, which is a group of life forms I talked about in my last Spec Evo video. They're part of their own biological domain full of strange and ancient life. The Tanacat is one of the more tame, though it's likely that it metamorphosizes into something less friendly. No one can be sure though, because they always disappear once they get old enough. This is usually by their 10th year, when they weigh about 30 kilograms. It can be argued that the Tanacat domesticated people rather than the other way around, as it kind of just appeared one day and figured out it could get food from people who thought it was cute. There is evidence that they carry a parasitic protozoan that could possibly affect the central nervous system of people who have become infected by handling a tannic hat. Frighteningly, more than 10% of people have this parasite inside them. 
More research must be done, but there are theories that this parasite might make people more likely to feed Tanicat. Again, that's just a theory. Again. Now I'll talk more about some pets I haven't really mentioned in other videos, though you might have noticed the first one in the background of my magic video. I'm talking about them in order of how common they are, so the first is a ferungulate mammal called a spirit dog. They're common pretty much everywhere, not just as a pet, but for the various jobs they do. There are near countless different breeds of them thanks to how long they've been domesticated, from the tiny peewee ken to the intimidating okado ken. They range from 10 kilograms to 200, though they all fall within the same species Aniken domesticus. Spirit dogs are their closest living relatives to pseudogemorphs that aren't pseudogemorphs. They're all part of a taxonomic order called Artiodactyla, which includes stuff like bovids, deer, hippos, and pigs. While the others might opportunistically eat meat from time to time, spirit dogs and pseudogemorphs are the only surviving true carnivores in this group. This helps make spirit dogs a great pet, because they have more time to play and don't have to be constantly eating and digesting food. With how diverse spirit dogs look, one tends to wonder what they were domesticated from. Even though they've been extinct for a while, we can get an idea of what they look like thanks to lichen historians. You could call these spirit wolves if you want, but they really look more like a weird pig hyena. They were domesticated in the Ogident, spread to the Glaciant soon after, then were adopted in the Orient during the Middle Ages. Most breeds are purely aesthetic, but Okado Kens were bred for combat and security, Snow Kens were bred for herding in the Glaciant, and Ipo Kens were bred for hunting. There are tons of other working dogs, but I felt like talking about those. Lastly, I'm just going to acknowledge that they have fire on their torso. This fire doesn't actually come from them, it comes from an animal they share a synergistic relationship with. The spirit flea is a near microscopic animal that feeds on the energy of the dog, though it also provides the element of fire, which clearly has helped the dog survive till modern day with its powerful magic. No one wants to mess with you if you're covered in fire, and it helps if you can also use the fire in your magic attacks. While it gave them their namesake spirit fire, it also inspired the worldwide phrase, if you lie down with dogs, you wake up with fleas. The fleas aren't so nice to anything that isn't a spirit dog. Next up is the Anyowo, an incredibly common pet among Nucius. It's actually one of their closest living relatives, though they diverged more than 50 million years ago. They evolved from basal pseudosuchians, which as archosaurs are also dragons. If you didn't understand that last part, don't worry about it, they're dragons. They have small blunt horns under the fluff, which is probably vestigial at this point. They were domesticated from a much bigger sphinxoid dragon tens of thousands of years ago on low tide island thanks to their speed, which helped find and corner prey. Larger breeds made for this though are no longer around. The most historically notable of these larger breeds is the war god Onyowo, which was bred specifically to kill other Nucius. Its maw resembles the maw of a Sudojin, which is notably very capable of tearing apart the carotid arteries of large animals. The war god was also responsible for the extinction of the monkey-like Draco simians, which it hunted when it wasn't hunting Nucius. The war god itself went extinct when Draconiae took over about 10,000 years ago, along with most of the other large Onyuo breeds. The Draconiae called them Sinocephals, or dog heads, and slaughter them on sight thinking they were demons. Sudojins are sometimes called Sinocephals as well, but it's generally not considered a very nice word. All that's left of Onyuo now is the fluffy breed, the smooth breed, and their color morphs. They really only exist as pets, but the ones who live outdoors or are feral might hunt small animals from time to time. There are concerns about them hunting or alcan feeding native species, so it's best to keep them indoors. Another dragon pet is the Snuglong, which is a derived Ornithischian dinosaur. Unlike most Ornithischians, it's an obligate carnivore. Snuglog, Snuglog, Snuglong was domesticated from a chunkier form about a thousand years ago to help catch small and fast prey. It was also domesticated by Nucius, though this time by Draconiae closer to north. The wild form is found in the Occident, but domesticated Snuglong are most common in the Glaciant thanks to their usage in finding food. 
Those snuglong are quite a bit bigger than the ones kept as pets in other places, which are more slender. Their claws are small and built for running, and they hunt with their deceptively strong jaws. The snuglong uses its agility to bite chunks off its prey until they're too weak to fight, then finishes them off as it eats them alive. They're gruesome hunters, but many people still find them cute. A third dragon pet is the hippogriff. These are another that's more of a steed than a pet, but many people form strong bonds with their hippogriff, so I figure it counts. This species of ground Asdarkid pterosaur is found all over the world, usually in feral populations. No wild form has ever been found, but they're most likely from the glaciant, allowing them to be domesticated in both the old and new world before they fully knew of each other. Because of how this happened, there are two distinct lineages of domestic hippogriff, though they likely convergently evolved similar traits that the wild form didn't have, such as a shorter neck, straighter back, longer legs, and a more cooperative demeanor. The most notable difference is with their crests. Occidental hippogriffs tend to have larger, curvier crests, while oriental ones have short, spiky ones. It seems that old world traditions value a bit of pizzazz in their war beasts. A more important difference, even if less noticeable, is how they metabolize foods. Most steed riding people in the Occident, Nusius and Sudosians, are obligate carnivores, and feed their hippogriffs accordingly. And while the wild forms were most likely obligate carnivores as well, oriental hippogriffs are very good at metabolizing starches and other things found in grains and other fruits. This is because the people from there, humanoids, tend to eat that stuff as well, and it's what's most available. Domesticated hippogriffs aren't so common in the Glaciant, but there's a unique breed in Clover that's much closer related to the Occidental ones, but they tend to metabolize foods more like the Oriental ones thanks to trifle eating habits resembling other humanoids. They can run at a maximum speed of 90 km an hour, but it's usually closer to 55. Sophoid mushrooms are a diverse group of fungi that have something like a nervous system. Sophid mushrooms within that have a brain-like structure. While these intensely magical organisms certainly have some kind of intelligence, it's hard to measure. Pseudomyces is a misnomer as they are true mushrooms, it's just that early science thought they were mimics. While they do tend to mimic other things, they are still actually mushrooms. They're the only fungi capable of complex animal-like locomotion, and one of them is the next pet featured in this video. The false bath shroom mimics a different non-sophoid mushroom, the bath shroom. To understand the former, we must understand the latter. The bath shroom is a basidomycete mushroom that appears in damp, dirty places, most commonly your bathroom. They really- <laughs> not, not your bathroom, just a bathrooms in general. I'm not insulting your bathroom. They release moderately toxic spores and can easily make people sick if they spend an extended amount of time near it. The false bath shroom likely evolved to mimic it because it didn't want to be eaten, though now it'll often be confused for a real bath shroom and exterminated for it. However, while the false bath shroom appears in the same places as the fungus it mimics, it's usually something you'd like to have around. They eat gross stuff around the bathroom and kind of clean it for you. However, if your bathroom is too clean, they'll walk into your kitchen and steal other food. Kitchen bathrooms are considered pests and often an infestation. While there have always been people who enjoy the company of false bathrooms, people have very recently tried to domesticate them. They are very docile if cared for, and though they are no different from any other false bathrooms, they seem to make a good pet. The last pet I'll talk about today is a weird one called a pussycat. They vaguely resemble the Tana cat and while both their names are shortened to cat, it's unknown which one was named after the other. They're one of the closest living relatives of humanoids, which makes them uncanny to most. Humanoids themselves though are narcissistic enough to love them. Admittedly, cats are very cute. The domesticated species is hard to tell apart from wild ones, which is pretty unusual for something that's been domesticated for thousands of years. Their high intelligence and social nature were already a thing before their domestication, so the only anatomical changes were very minor, such as a slightly shorter skull and generally smaller body size. The pussycat is an excellent hunter even in the wild, and is responsible for the extinction of many rare animals, mostly birds, in places the cat has been brought to. 
It's useful to people because it hunts pests, though it's only kept by humanoids, mostly in the Orient. While the wild forms are also found in the Orient, feral populations are found all over the world, and those are mostly the ones responsible for all those extinctions. Although it's not so popular now, the reason it was once popular enough to be found all over the world is that the white cat is a symbol for those who worship a certain elder god, one I haven't talked about before, called Dorodea. This is why white cats are particularly common across origin, though other color morphs aren't uncommon. Dorodea was supposedly worshipped worldwide during a near mythological event referred to as the Eternal Winter Night. Obviously, it wasn't eternal since I can look outside my window right now and see the sun in all its glory. But yeah, Dorodea was said to have become the sun for those who worshipped her, and supposedly everyone alive today is descended from worshippers of this elder god. Don't take all that as fact though. The only real evidence of this is a recent minor extinction event in the fossil and archaeological record, and the previously mentioned abundance of white cats. But yeah, now you know what people are on about if you hear them going crazy about the goddess of the eternal winter night. That's about it for this video. Consider supporting me on Patreon where you can give just a dollar a month to also get your name at the end of my videos and access to some sillier non-scripted videos. Thanks Captain Kobop and Art of Dying. On Thursday, I'm going to post a little sketch I did of a silly guy who relates to my last two Spec Evo videos, along with a short, similarly silly story. And no, Eric, I haven't sent you that yet, so go look at my Patreon, gosh darn it. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. You can just text me if you want. Anyway, those of you who are not Eric, my next Spec Evo video will be about biological ranged attackers. Hope to see you there, and thanks for watching.